how's it going? Good? You guys good? Okay, I'm, I'm not going to kid you. When I was a kid, I'm from Kansas, by the way. Anyone from Kansas, Nebraska, you're here. I know that. So, hold on. Are you all just from Minnesota? Who's from Minnesota? Okay. Who's not from Minnesota? Okay, there you go. So when I was a kid, we vacationed every summer in Minnesota. And so I can't even begin to tell you how pumped I am to vacation with you all this weekend. Amen? Yes? So if we're going to spend the whole weekend together, I really would love to get to know you. And you can get to know me in about five slides, yeah? Okay, this is the first slide. This is my husband, Swath. His name is Andy. No one calls him Swaff. Everyone calls him Swaff, not Andy. Um, our last name's Swafford, right? So he's a professor at Benedictine College. He teaches theology. So the students call him Doc Swaff or Swaff Daddy or P. P Diddy Swaff. Um, David Hassel Swaff is my personal favorite. Um, but you guys don't know who that is, but that's okay. All the youth ministers are like, huh, oh, that's funny. Um, all, I always put this slide up. We've been married 13 years, and I always put this slide up, and all the girls are always like, dang, Sarah, he's cute. And I'm like, I'm aware. I'm aware. He's a very, he's a very good looking man. He is an, he's an amazing man. And he is very cute, but not as cute as our kids. So these are our kids. I know. It's just out of control, right? Aren't they just so cute? This is Thomas. Thomas, any firstborns out there? Anybody the firstborn in their family? Yeah? Me too. Your mom loves you. Thank you for being so helpful. Amen. Yeah? I don't know what I would do without him. Oh my gosh. This is Fulton. So Fulton, any Archbishop Fulton Sheen fans in the crowd? It's really fun. When we were naming him, I was like, dude, Swaff, this works. Like if he is like intelligent, he can like smoke a pipe and like wear a sweater vest, right? And he'd be like, Sir Fulton Swafford, like that totally works, right? Or if he is an athlete, he can like run through a tunnel and it's like, Fulton Swafford. And you're like, yeah, right? Like that works too. Anybody the second born in your family? Anybody? Okay, good. Um, this is Kate, Miss Kate. So I know, she's named after St. Catherine of Siena. Um, she is going straight to the convent. She's very excited about it, yeah? She's discerned well. She's really fun. Anybody the only girl in their family? Anybody the only girl in their family? Me too. It helps me to understand Kate, because she'll be like, Mom, let's paint nails. I'm like, yeah, like paint nails. And then she like jumps in the wrestling pile, and she's like, ah, dang. Oh, well, right? Like, and this is Colby Joseph. So I know, he's edible. You can just like pop him in your mouth, right? He gets no attention at all. We're really worried about him. So, <laughs> Colby Joseph. Um, so, here's the deal. He's actually pretty holy because uh, this happened a couple months ago. Do you know who that is? That's Colby. It's just really good, isn't it? When this girl in the front, she's like, oh my gosh. I'm like, I know, that's what I said too. I was like, what? That's my kid, right? And then I was like, relics, yes, right? So this is my family, and it's really fun because I, I, I love this picture. Um, there's always a story to every picture, amen? So everyone looks at this picture and they're like, oh my gosh, like you're perfect family. And I'm like, <laughs> lies, right? <laughs> you guys ever had that day, that family picture day where you're like freezing and everyone is like not in their best, you know, not having their best day. And your mom's like, look, I'll give you $20. I'll give you pizza. I'll give you ice cream. I'll give you a pony. I don't care what you need, but I need you to smile for this picture right now. Right? This was, we took 200 pictures that day. This is the only one where we were all looking at the camera. Right? <laughs> Do you see my baby up there? That's a rock on his head. Yeah, a rock. A boulder, actually. Have you ever tried to take away a rock from a two-year-old? Don't even try it, right? You're just like, hey, that's our pet rock. It's in every Christmas card. I don't even care, right? Because, you guys, seriously, the reason why we're insecure is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. Amen? That was a highlight reel, right? So here's the deal. I'm going to give you the behind the scenes. This is the most ec epic minute of the Swafford family. Are you ready? Okay. 
So these are just really good pictures of me. Sorry, I just had to. This is me trying to be fun, but I just can't really make a face. Let's be real. This is me without makeup and my hair and ponytail were at McDonald's. This is a great angle if you ever want to show a triple chin. This is a still shot of my triple chin. This is me looking constipated. I don't know what's wrong. This is epic in every way. Kate wins for best picture on that one. Colby's just a mess. I don't even know what to do with that. Kate was like, what? She's got chalk all over her face. That's a Christmas card worthy. That's Christmas card worthy. His favorite hat is my shower cap. All we have is nose pictures. And Hi. this is my personal favorite. <laughs> Hello. Colby doesn't understand that you don't die every time. He just hits people and he dies. <laughs> and then he hits people. Ow. And he dies. <laughs> And this, is, isn't, this isn't me, but let's be real. Like, that's the picture on social media, and that's the one we send our friends. Amen? <laughs> I just feel like it's just, we just all need to look at it for a while, right? Just everyone stare at that for a minute, right? <laughs> it just brings joy to my life, right? This whole weekend, the theme is revealed, right? Let's be real. Let's get real. Who is God the Father and who are we? Because the world has all kinds of suggestions and ideas for who you should be. I call it the world's idea perfect, right? Ladies, what do you have to be? Like size negative two, right? Big doe eyes, perfect bangs, flawless skin. If you can't figure it out, Pinterest has about a million videos to help you figure it out, right? You have to have your group of like girls that follow you around in real life, right? Your little followers that worship you and follow you. Trophy boyfriend on one arm. All the girls want to be you and all the guys want to be with you, but, and everybody talks about it, but you know, nobody talks about it, but everyone's it, and you just like, Shh, it's the world's idea perfect, right? You could be like Tay, Bayer, Kim, Selena. We, we have different like, boxes to put us in, right? But you better play the game, and you better play it well. All the men out there, what do you have? Like the male version of world's idea perfect. I always get this image of like a rapper in a white tux with like a gold grill and shades, and he's like standing on a car. And there's like cash falling from the sky. And there's like, you know, a girl crawling up his leg and he's just standing there. He's like, it's Port Malone, right? No, let's be real. It's Harry Styles. But, <laughs> or Sean Menendez, is that Menendez? Is that how you say his name? Yeah. Mendez. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Fellas, what do you have to be? Chiseled and charming? Successful at everything you touch? You can be like an athlete or a musician or you can be an artist. We don't really care. Just don't fail. Right, men? You have to have the group of followers that follow you around, trophy girlfriend on one arm. All the guys want to be you, all the girls want to be with you, and everybody knows it, but nobody talks about it because it's the world's idea perfect. And you like see celebrities and you're like scrolling on, you know, everything, scrolling on Instagram. And you like see celebrities and there's like a little bit of a buffer there because it's like, okay, you have $50 million and like, you know, a personal trainer and attendant, we're just very happy for you. Like, go you, right? But then you're like laying in bed and scrolling at like 11 o'clock at night. And it's not just celebrities anymore. Who is it? It's the people sitting on both sides of you. It's the people you pass every day in the hall. And it's so easy to sit there and scroll and scroll and scroll and then put your phone on your nightstand and be like, why do I feel so worthless? Like, what is the deal? I'm hustling. Like, I'm moving. I'm trying the best I can to do everything I need to do to be everything I'm supposed to be. And it's just not enough. You guys, I went through junior high, high school, college, got engaged, got married, and had Thomas and Fulton before I knew what social media was. I'm 35, not 85. Everyone's like, how old is she? Oh my gosh. Right? Y'all questioned it. And I saw your face. Okay. You guys, I missed it by one year. I was a hot mess in high school and I didn't even have a phone. I stand before you because I am so proud of you for fighting this fight. I don't know how you do it. I really don't. I'm in this fight with you because I just stand in awe. It is so messy. It, the struggle is real. Amen? You guys... I think the three questions that we ask all the time are, am I enough? And am I ever gonna be truly loved? And am I ever gonna be known? Known, enough, loved. I used to ask myself that all the time, you guys. I was bullied so bad in junior high, I had to switch schools. And those left wounds in my heart of rejection and dismissal. And I spent all of high school going around to different people, asking, do you think I'm enough? Do you, think I'm, do you think I'm smart enough? Do you, I mean, you don't say it out loud, but that's in your mind, right? Would you choose me? Like, am I enough? 
Am I athletic enough? Am I creative enough? Am I pretty enough? Would you date me? Would you put me like fifth on the list, right? Like, it's kind of, we just keep asking those questions. And what happened was I just continued to build these different facades, right? So like, what do you need? Okay, well, I desperately don't want you to reject me. So like, whatever you need, like, I can do that. I can be that, right? I can, I'm, I'm gonna just build these walls. I'll be whoever you need me to be. And I started building these walls around my heart. They started, they were pretty high because I didn't want anyone to get too close because what if they didn't like what they saw? And I did it to God as well, all the time. I would say things like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change this, I'm going to fix that, I'm going like, to get better at this, I'm going to not do that, I'm going to lose 10 pounds, and then present myself like the perfect Sarah to God, and then God will love me, because then I'll be enough. But right now, like, I need you to just like, be like, just a little bit of a distance. I sideline God, right? Like, he was kind of this like, ATM machine, genie in a bottle, teddy bear, Santa Claus type figure that I like, knew I was supposed to have in my life, but I didn't know how he fit in my life. I wanted him there, but I didn't know how much, how much he, I wanted him to see. And what kept happening is I would go to different people. I would go to different women, go to different men, especially in dating relationships, and I would do whatever I needed to do to make sure that those wounds of rejection and dismissal would never come back, that I would be able to not feel those wounds. So I played a lot of different roles, which you do too. I put on a lot of different faces until one day the cycle of use was called out to me. I heard someone talk about the cycle of use. And unfortunately, I don't have to explain it to you because you already know what it is, right? Men will use women to get what they want and women will use men to get what they want, right? Men use women, women use men to get what they want. Unfortunately, in our world, it looks like this. Men will use women emotionally. They'll manipulate them, get them where they're most vulnerable to get what they want, which is usually sex. And then women will use their sex appeal, their bodies, what they know they have to offer to get what they want, which is to feel loved or to feel romanced or to feel desired or to be honest, to feel anything at all. And the cycle just keeps going. And men use women emotionally and physically, and women use men emotionally and physically, and it just goes in the cycle of pain and hurt. In my life, that's what it was. Do you know what I'm talking about? Close your eyes for one second. Just for one minute, close your eyes. I want you to think about a time in your life where you were used, either emotionally or physically, and you knew it. Maybe think about a time in your life where you use someone else, either emotionally or physically, and you knew it. Or maybe it was a time in your life where you watched someone that you love, your best friend, your sibling, be used emotionally or physically, and you knew it. Or maybe you watched someone that you love use somebody else emotionally or physically, and you knew it, and you didn't know what to do or how to help. Okay, you can open your eyes. Everybody take a deep breath in. Let it out, right? Those are four of the heaviest questions that I could ask you or that you could ask me, because there's not a single person in this room that hasn't been used in some way. And when I had that called out to me, it changed my life, because you know what? I never recognized it. I didn't know I was being used and I didn't know I was using others because as human beings, we're not wired for that. We're not wired to use people. That's not how we work. But it happens all the time. And I want to teach you two little sentences that I want you to put on a little like fortune cookie piece of paper. And I want you to put them in your back pocket. And I want you to pull them out and use them anytime you need them, okay? Repeat after me. I will not use you. And I will not let you use me. I dropped the mic, but I value the mic, right? Repeat after me, I will not use you. And I will not let you use me. I walked into college with those two sentences on my heart. I was in a really dark place. And I walked into college and I signed up for a retreat because I was kind of a last ditch effort to figure out how I was gonna figure this whole life thing out. I walked into the retreat, I didn't know anybody super well, and so finally adoration and confession came, and I got into the confession line. I hadn't been in a while, and it was like I got in the line, I went all the way to the front of the line, got out of the line, got back in the line, I did it two times, right? And then I finally went in there, and I walked in, and I looked at this sweet baby priest, right, who was just like a brand new priest, 
And Abedi was like, what am I going to do with this chick, right? Like, and the best life advice, the best dating advice, the best change my life advice came from this sweet baby priest on a retreat. So when anyone tells you that priests don't know what's up, you just drop, kick, good, okay, good. Um, I laid out this, I laid out everything. I said, all my insecurities, all my fears, all, my, all the pressure I was under, all of my mistakes, the cycle of use, my wounds, everything that I was feeling in my life that was bearing so hard on my soul. I just walked in there and I laid it out. And this priest looked at me and he said to me, Sarah, this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to build a box. And I want you to take that box and I want you to put everything that you're struggling with into that box. And I want you to drop it off at the feet of someone who can actually do something about it. I want you to give it to our Lord. And then I want you to fall into his arms and I want you to let him love you like no human can. Because you keep going to all these people, especially to men, and trying to make them your savior. And Sarah, you don't need a savior because you already have one. So let God be God and let people be people. And he said, you, when you feel whole and you feel strong, you stand up and you run with our Lord. And he'll show you who you truly are. I walked out and I got back in front of adoration. And I looked at the monstrance and I said, who am I? And it was so clear, you guys. He said, I'm, like I looked at the monstrance and I said, I'm yours and you're mine. God the Father started pursuing me with reckless abandon because I allowed him to. I let him for the first time. Bricks fell down one by one and he pursued me because I let him. I got in the gaze of our Lord. I didn't dodge. He would try to pursue me and I would dodge because I didn't think I was worthy or put together enough, right? I didn't think I had it all together. I thought that mistakes from the past and he blew that up. You guys, that is so backwards. He wants you to bring that mess into that confessional and drop it off. Leave it and let people be people and let him be your savior, amen? That night changed my life because what I found was my identity. He said, you're a beloved daughter. You're mine. You're my beloved daughter. That is your identity. You're not your labels. You're not your accomplishments. You're not your performance, Sarah. You're not what people said about you in seventh grade. You're not what mean people said about you. You're not what ex-boyfriends said about you. That's not who you are. You're mine. You're my daughter. You're my beloved daughter, and I love you. Are, I know you guys are asking, am I enough? Am I ever going to be truly loved? The only place you will ever find that answer is in that gaze. The only place you'll ever be convicted. You can go to a lot of people, but you will only be convicted that you are enough and that you are truly loved in the gaze. Don't dodge. Let the Father show you. Because we know who we are when we know who he is. Amen? So if you're the beloved daughter and the beloved son of his, and he's God the Father... Who is he? This is who he is. Maybe. Oh, hi. Oh, hi. You guys are getting a cool preview of who he is. We're beloved sons and daughters of God the Father. We're beloved sons and daughters of the Father who created all things, including you and me, out of love. We're beloved sons and daughters of God the, of God the Father who gave his only begotten son, to suffer and die on a cross to save us from sin and death. We're the beloved sons and daughters of the Father who raised Christ from the dead so that we might have eternal life with him forever. And we're beloved sons and daughters of the most loving of fathers who promised he would never abandon us and proved it by sending the Holy Spirit to always be with us, for we are never alone. I know that it's hard to believe. My husband always says, What's, it's not hard to, you know, all these like high teachings of the, of the church and all these like hard truths. He's like, that's not the hardest thing to believe. The hardest thing to believe is that the God of the universe loves me, this like speck of matter that's just down here hanging out, loves me as much as he loved his only begotten son who he sent to die for me so that I could be with him forever. That should blow your mind, amen? He knows you. He created you. He's got the blueprint for how you're going to be happy. And he's pursuing you with reckless abandon. Every, you guys, 
when we look at the world, it's like we're looking for those things and we like forget that God's the answer. We forget that there's this God who's pursuing us recklessly. Jesus reveals the face of the Father. Jesus reveals the Father to us, amen? What does it look like? What does he look like? Do you guys know the prodigal son? Do you guys know that? You know that story, right? Everyone's like, yeah, we're Catholics area. We go to mass, right? Like, you know that story, right? But here's the deal. The theme of this whole weekend is revealed. Will you do me a favor this weekend? Like, will you see everything this weekend with new eyes? As you listen to all the readings, that you, you know, just all the scripture that's going to come at you, all these beautiful things that you're going to be seeing, will you just see it with fresh eyes? Like this story of the prodigal son. See it with fresh eyes. What does he do, right? The prodigal son, he goes to his dad and he says, you know what, Pops, like, I'm just not feeling it. Like, I think this whole farm business is just not for me. I would like a third of my inheritance and I'm going to go party. And I really don't care what you think and I really don't want to be here anymore. So I'll take my inheritance and I'm out. And the father hands it over to him and says, you go. And he leaves. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. My favorite part about the prodigal son is twofold. One, the father watched him walk away. The father let him walk away. You guys, our heavenly father, does, he's not a tyrant. He doesn't lord things over you. He doesn't look at you and say, okay, if then. God the father isn't an if then. If you do this, our, you guys, the way we operate as human beings is like, okay, I know what I need to do in order to feel loved or to be enough or to be known. I have to work hard. I have to do this, 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 and this. You guys, that is not how God the father works. He loves you unconditionally. One of my favorite sayings is, it's, it's not that God loves you when you're good. God loves you because he's good. And his love for you doesn't go up or down based on your performance. I know that a lot of you have dads in your life that are amazing. Your dad might be your best friend. Some of you might have a hard and difficult relationship with your dad. Some of you may not get along with your dad at all. Some of you may not have a dad. Some of you may wish that you didn't have a dad. That's how deep those father wounds are. Every single person in this room has a different relationship with your dad, and I know that. But the one thing that you cannot do is project those wounds on God the Father because that is not how he is. He is perfect. And your father, your, your earthly father is going to fail. He's not perfect. That's why we look to God the Father because he is the example. He is the one. And God the Father says, I pursue you but I'm not gonna force you into a relationship with me. And if you, if you heard and read carefully in the prodigal son, did you guys hear that line where he said, and while the son was still far off, the father saw him. Did you guys hear that? While he was still far off, the father saw him. What does that mean? It means he was waiting for him. It means he was looking for him. 
He was praying that he would come back. That's how God the Father is with you right now. That's what God wants from you, is this night in a whole new way to see him, let him be revealed to you as the perfect loving father. And it's hard because we have wounds, amen? We have wounds, whether it's from different relationships in our life, whether it's from the cycle of use, whether it's from the world's idea of perfect, we have wounds. I revealed to you some of my wounds. I have anxiety. I have wounds of rejection and dismissal. And sometimes we need someone to look us in the eye and speak truth to our heart. Sometimes that, those little small voices that come up and say, you're not enough, you're not gonna be truly loved. When those little voices creep up, you need someone to speak truth to your heart. I have a friend, I have a best friend who is seriously like the coolest, most fun, holy person, like holy dude, cool dude. And we were hanging out one time and all of these like insecurities crept up in me. All of these like wounds from the past started creeping up in my heart. And these words that were coming to me were like, you're not worthy to hang out with him. Like you don't offer him anything. He doesn't need you. It doesn't even, I mean like you can't give him anything. He's gonna walk because you, you can't keep up with him. He's just out of your league. It's just too cool. And all these insecurities started like creeping up in me. I'm like, he's gonna walk. And I got the strength to tell him. I was like, and he looked at me and he spoke truth to my heart. And he said to me, he said, you're right. I don't need anything from you, Sarah. I have no expectations for you. And I think, he said, I think what God wants right now is for you to know what it's like to be loved unconditionally by God the Father. Because God has no conditions on you, Sarah. Just be you. You're enough for me and for God. And my best friend, the person that looked at me and spoke that truth to my heart is here this weekend with us. It's Father John Burns. And I can't tell you how excited I am that you get to be with him this weekend. I can't tell you how excited I am for you to be with Steve and to be with Cooper and to be with Brian and to be with Sonar and to be with Connor the Rapper. Amen? Because I am gonna, like, I wanna fight for you, you guys. Everybody in this room, I wanna fight for you. I wanna fight to clear everything out of the way so that you can sit in the gaze of Jesus Christ, sit in his sacred heart and let the Father pour down love upon you that you have never experienced. I want you to sit here tonight in adoration. In that gaze, do not dodge. You are enough, you are loved, and I want the God of the universe to tell you that you're his and that he loves you. And you don't have to do anything. There are no expectations on you. This whole weekend, we're just gonna clear stuff out of the way so you can get in that gaze, amen? Are you with me? I love you. I've been praying for you for months. I am so excited to experience this with you. I pray with music a lot. I don't know if you guys pray with music, but this song that I wanna pray with you, I want, I want you to let it wash over you. When I asked you to see this weekend with fresh eyes, I mean it. Like I want you to come into this, this weekend like a page turner, right? I want you to page, like turn the page on your life and we're just gonna like title a new, a new chapter, amen? I think we're gonna do Revealed. Does that sound good? Flip it, Revealed. That is what we're gonna do this weekend. Heavenly Father, reveal to us your love. I want you all to just let this song wash over you. I wanna, I'm gonna pray with you, I wanna pray. You know, just, you can hold your hands out, you can just sit. Remember, there's no conditions, there's no expectations. Just let him love you and wash over you. Let's pray together.